Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion, created by Think Tank Hawaii and Kingsfield Law Office. We invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and contributions to cultural diversity. Today is our distinguished honor and pleasure to have Mr. Stephen Trachtenberg, President Emeritus of George Washington University, to be our distinguished guest. Welcome, President Trachtenberg. Thank you, Professor. I appreciate being here. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be our guest. You, are, you have a very long and accomplished career. If I read the, if we, we do it normal way, read the guest biography, it takes five days. <laughs> so, so I'm going to read just, with your permission, I'm going to read a shorter version of your uh, biography. Steven Trachtenberg is President Emeritus and a university professor of public service at George Washington University. He served as 15th president, president of the GWU for nearly two decades, from 1988 to 2007. He came to GWU from the University of Hartford, where he had been president for 11 years. Before assuming the presidency of Hartford, he served as eight years at Boston University as Vice President for Academic Services and Academic Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Earlier in Washington, D.C., he was Special Assistant for two years to the United States Education Commissioner, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. He has been an attorney with the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and the legislative aide to former Indiana Congressman John Brandemas. At the GWU, Mr. Trachtenberg started a full scholarship program for DC public school students, increased the national profile of the university, and fostered the observance of school traditions such as George Washington, George Washington birthday celebration. During his tenure as president of the university, he created five, he created five new schools, public health and public services, public policy and public administration, college of professional studies, graduate school of political management, and media and public affairs. The university renamed the, pub, the School of Public Policy for Mr. Trachtenberg, calling it Trachtenberg School of Public Policy at GWU. He is author of numerous books, including The Art of Hiring in American Colleges and Universities, Thinking Out Loud, Reflections on Higher Education, Speaking His Mind, and Big Man on Campus, among others. Mr. Trachtenberg received 16 honorary degrees, including an honorary degree of law degree from Columbia University, a doctor of public service degree from the George Washington University, an honorary doctor of public administration degree from South Korea's Kunji University, and another doctor of law degree from Hanyang University, and an honorary doctor of humanities degree from the University of Hartford. Mr. Trachtenberg is also a recipient of Ellis Island Medal of Honor. He is a member of Academy of Acad American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Welcome again. <laughs> this is just a shorter version of your bio. Uh, Thank you, President uh, Trachtenberg. Your life, uh, you know, spans uh, several decades. There are so many accomplishments, and we can only name just a, a few. But today, our topic is you, uh, obviously including your career, but we also want to talk about you, your family, and your life. So I understand you're a second generation Ukrainian American. Could you please tell us a little bit about your family and how did they settle in the United States? Well, they came after the, uh, they came uh, shortly after the uh, revolution. Uh, and uh, 19, 19 1919, something like that. And they came in bits and parts. I mean, my grandfather came uh, and then he brought uh, other members of the family over. 
Um, and of course, different. Um, th there are different stories on my father's side and different stories on my mother's side. Uh, my mother's family came from uh, Odessa in the Ukraine, uh, to, first to Palestine. Uh, it was oh. then uh, British uh, British Mandate Palestine, and uh, and uh, uh, frankly, they lived in a tent uh, uh, in in Tel Aviv uh, back in the day. Uh, my grandfather uh, tried to make a living, uh, was not successful, came to the United States, uh, opened a hand laundry in the Bronx and, uh, and uh, slept in the back of the, in back of the laundry. Um, and um, ultimately saved enough money to send for his wife and, uh, and, uh, and children, and among them my mother. Uh, my father's family came also originally from Odessa, but they came directly uh, to the United States. And my parents met in New York at some sort of social event. And here we are. So you grew up in, in New York. I grew up in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn, Brooklyn New York. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, lived, uh, we lived in a one-bedroom uh, uh, apartment in an apartment house. My parents, for obvious reasons, took the bedroom, and I slept on a uh, fold-out uh, cot uh, behind the piano in the living room. That's quite a story. The you are you were born in the United States, and uh, but you have this very uh, strong cultural background. So when you grew up, will you feel like you have a, a different cultural heritage? Or you were just uh, very much mixed in this uh, big app already? Well, um, I grew up in a community of first generation uh, uh, young people. Mm. Uh, almost all of my friends uh, were first generation. Their parents came from Turkey, they came, they came from uh, uh, Russia, they came from different parts of Europe, uh, Lithuania, uh, uh, France. But, uh, but my age group were all first generation. Uh, mm. And uh, with the exception of my wife, who was third generation and mm. claims that she's the authentic uh, American in the family. Um, but everybody, uh, everybody, uh, everybody's parents had some kind of an, an, an accent. Mm. Uh, my best, one of my best friends was a, a kid named Richie Anderson, uh, whose parents were Scandinavian. And, um, uh, spoke with very thick accent, and uh, when my mother and his mother used to get together, uh, you needed an interpreter to, to, to understand what they were saying to each other. Um, and his father had a fishing boat out of Sheepshead Bay. Uh, my father sold life insurance, so mm -hmm. we were all sort of lower lower middle class. Uh, nobody was missing any meals, but uh, but we didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Understood. Uh, from my heavy accent, you can probably knew that I'm from also an exotic part of the world. But when I hear uh, people speaking accent, you know, I understand that they learn the language by reading, and I have a respect for that. But uh, obviously, there are some people when they hear people speak in heavy accent or even a slight accent. They, they close their ears and they, they, they find it very difficult to communicate. So I'm delighted to know that you, you, you grew up in an immigrant, immigrant community. You, but uh, out of this community, you have an amazing career and uh, you are one of the most successful you know, descendants of immigrants I ever met. You have been the leader of three very prestigious organizations and you you know, honestly, it, it is my belief that you transformed George W. University in a profound way and make George, George Washington University a world-class university during your tenure. And you also are a very accomplished scholar and author. You published five books. And I, may, and I really appreciate uh, the uh, two copies you, you gave to me, and I, I read it with great interest. The, among all these books, which books is your favorite? Oh, um, well, thank you, first of all, for your very kind words. I, I really appreciate it. I think you, you're being too generous, but I'm going to take the compliment. Um, uh, 
I think speaking speaking his mind is probably the most uh, uh, interesting book uh, mm -hmm. of the books I've written. Uh, the others tend to be sort of professional. They're books about higher education. Mm -hmm. So as a professor, of course, you would you would appreciate some of what I've done, uh, and um, and others in the in the business, so to speak, if I can use that word about the academy. Uh, would as well. They are largely observations about what I think are shortcomings or virtues of American universities. Uh, and many of them are speeches that I've crafted into book chapters, which uh, I gave at various events and, and uh, occasions. Uh, but speaking, speak, uh, speaking his mind uh, is uh, in the nature of a, an autobiography or, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think regular, regular non-professorial people would find that the most interesting. Thank you very much. I, I definitely will, will read that book as, uh, with great interest as well. Uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, some of your books are about professional, uh, which I uh, take as, you know, talk about the higher education as the uh, uh, you know, administrator and leader of higher education. And some of the, uh, uh, the a book, at least one book of yours mentioned the hiring for the university and the college leaders. Yes. So I understand that they are, uh, normally there are two methods to choose an institutional leader, not limited to higher educational institutions, uh, whether it is a university or, co or company. So method one, hire someone with leadership experience from another institution. That, I think a look at your uh, career, it's very much like your case. You were a uh, vice president of a major university, then you became a president of another university, then you became a president of a third university. That a second method is elevate somebody, normally a dean or a vice president from the institution, then uh, promoted her or him to be the leader of the institution. Yes. What, what are the advantages and the disadvantages, or what's your general comments of these two different approaches in choosing leaders? And or are, are there any other way to choose a leader? Yes. Well, I think I think each institution um, is going to have a different fact situation. Different things are going to be happening at different institutions at different times, mm -hmm. and and therefore uh, there is no one solution. Um, uh, there's no answer, I guess, that's really right for your question, unless you know more about the context in which the question fits the institution that's seeking a president. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine circumstances in which uh, it's important that they hire somebody that they know because there's mm -hmm. some crisis on the campus. And it's yeah. going to be reassuring to pick somebody who has been there for 10 years or 20 years and that, and that um, they've come to trust and uh, and who knows the uh, ins and outs of that institution mm. or you may have an institution that is desperately in need of change and they really need to bring somebody in who has had vision uh, at another institution has seen other institutions and experienced how they have done things and will bring a new uh, perspective a new lens to the to the institution so i don't have a, a specific answer but obviously, uh, you look for people of character, you look for people of vision, uh, you look for people ultimately of courage. Uh, courage. This change is very, is very daunting. People like progress, but they don't like change. Mm -hmm. And so if you come to a university uh, with some notion that you're going to change it, you're going to discover that the, nice, the nicest <laughs> professors, students, alumni, um staff and it are going to be against it they're going to they don't like it it's it makes them uncomfortable it uh, forces them to reinvent themselves and therefore um uh, uh you need to bring that sort of experience with you to in order to be able to be persuasive and you need you need people skills in the end mm -hmm. um i have never believed that university presidents had to be the smartest people in the room. I leave that to the faculty. Uh, I am modest about my own uh, my own academic abilities. Um, they were good enough, but I, I was never I was never marked to be a Nobel Prize winner. 
Um, and um, what I had were political skills and they went back to grade school. I was, I was president of uh, something or the other at PS 254 in Brooklyn and then president of the student body at James Madison High School. And, um, and, and my skills uh, uh, could have been applied in various contexts. I could, have, I could have been in hospital administration. I could have been in politics. Um, uh, and, and, um, and I think that's true in picking university leadership as well. Um, and in fact, I think a university president who thinks that he or she is the smartest person in the room is likely going to head into a problem because the faculty are likely to have somebody who is smarter than you are. Very well said. Thank you so much. There are a lot of, you know, to digest. I'm going to, to think it through because, you know, I always uh, think about what a, uh, to be a leader means and how, how do we choose a leader. And now we get to some uh, on the lighter side that, you know, uh, uh, my wife went to George Washington University. I have a big, uh, George Washington uh, University and uh, Foggy Bottom have a, uh, occupy a big place in our hearts. And uh, I, I always want to ask the question about to the leader of the university, why Hippo? The Hippo has been chosen as an unofficial mascot of George Washington University. You know, we, yeah. we have a we have a golfer at the University of Minnesota, and uh, why Hippo? Is a Hippo your favorite uh, animal? Uh, Hippopotamus actually are uh, very vicious animals. <laughs> vicious, okay. Uh, and uh, I think they are responsible for more deaths of human beings than any other Af <clears throat> animal in Africa. Um, oh. So they they are they are not sweet. Uh, do not uh, do not think um, that of, of hippopotamus. The answer the, the answer is it, it was totally accidental. My wife and I were sailing uh, in uh, Rhode Island, and she was then the vice president of uh, WETA, the television public television station in Washington, and they had some crisis, and. Um, and they called her up and said, we need you. And so she got on a plane and went back to Washington to deal with the problem, uh, leaving me, as she likes to put it, unattended. And so I, uh, I was wandering around in, uh, in uh, Providence <coughs> one morning, and, uh, and I came on a, um, an, a lot where they were selling uh, remnants from buildings that had been torn down. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, the vendor, the man who was running this place, uh, was very hospitable, and he invited me in. And uh, we ended up spending most of the day together sitting uh, in his, uh, in his uh, workplace, uh, having a couple of beers. And um, now the day was winding down, and um, I got up to leave. I thanked him for his hospitality. But I felt bad that I hadn't bought anything. <laughs> so I looked around, I looked around his, what he had, and I saw this hippopotamus. And uh, so I bought it. And uh, ultimately, uh, he shipped it to uh, New England, uh, from New England, rather, to Washington, where, where I was living. And when it arrived, my wife uh, 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 turned it down. Uh, it was meant to be a surprise gift for her. She was so surprised that she didn't want it. So, so <laughs> he said, look, lady, I, I, I either have to leave it here in the street or take it back to, to Rhode Island. I can't just, you know. So she said, take it over to the university and give it to my husband. He ordered, he ordered it. <laughs> he it. So my assistant, um, a woman named Rhoda Fisher, uh, did a search around the campus and ultimately uh, it found itself uh, on a little pedestal in front of uh, in front of um, one of our buildings, and she said, "What what do we say about it?" So we made up a story, absolute <laughs> fiction. Uh, uh, we made up a story that uh, George Washington and Martha used to like to sit on the plantation uh, at Mount Vernon and look at the hippopotamuses swimming in the Potomac River. Now, of course, this is absolutely untrue. <laughs> uh, and but uh, but but we made up a, a bronze plaque that said that, and we put it in front of in front of the hippopotamus. It, it, it was a grand uh, uh, practical joke. We had some fun, 
we thought we'd have the hippopotamus there for a few weeks and then it would disappear again. Uh, and we'd give it to somebody to put in their garden or something. In any case, the, the students liked it. It became part of the mythology of the institution. And it sits uh, in front of the uh, Lesnar Auditorium to this day. Yes, I saw it. It's a fantastic story. It's a, thank you so much for telling me that because I, I have been wondering that for years. And uh, uh, I, I'm surprised to, to learn that hippo is quite a vicious animal. My favorite animal is dog. And I believe the dog is an angel sent by God to make us a better human being. But I think hippo it will be difficult to, to relate. Anyway, thank you so much for telling us the story. That's very, very funny and very, very interesting. Uh, I appreciate you, you, you call me professor. Uh, yes, I'm a, a, a part-time professor and I am still teaching and I, have a, I still have a, a affiliations with uh, several higher education institutions. But, but of course, my, my main job is uh, the talk show host in addition to practicing law and teaching. But my student has been always divided on the statement, the statement I'm going to read. The goal of education, particularly legal education, is to preserve the status quo and perpetuate, perpetuate the hierarchy. So as an educator, what I want to ask you, the a leader of higher education, what, what do you think is the goal? of education. You know, we went to law school. Law school don't want to train revolutionary. We don't want to train any rebels. You know, those are progressive, uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, exceptions, but uh, everybody should know the law, thinking like a lawyer and uh, uh, to be a part of the system. Uh, but what about the whole educational system, the higher education? What, what's the primary purpose in your view? I think your students are right. Um, I think the purpose of, of education, once you get past uh, the basic skills of teaching people uh, how to count and how to read, uh, is to uh, support the, uh, the, the society, uh, that uh, the community that uh, mm -hmm. those students are, uh, are being brought up in. Um, different countries have different goals. Different countries have, have um, different histories mm -hmm. um they have different they have different origin stories uh, different lenses that they are using but i think basically uh, every country whether it's france or uh or england or, or russia or <coughs> united states uh its own uh, national uh, uh story is uh, is the purpose and maintaining that is the purpose of of uh, of uh, of education now obviously that's too simplistic left by itself so there are different aspects of education that are uh, addressing different parts of our of our uh, of our agenda uh, medical education uh, legal education uh, um uh, are, are going to serve different different parts of, of our society and the sciences uh, are going to be different than the social sciences, different than the humanities. They're going to vary by uh, by communities. Uh, um, so, you know, I I would think that a university like Howard uh, in Washington D.C. is going to have a commitment to uh, 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 America's African American story, True. and uh, and uh, Juilliard is going to have a commitment to music and uh, art, and dance, and uh, that's going to be distinguishable from MIT or Caltech, uh, which are devoted to uh, engineering and the sciences, and, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, I think higher education and education writ large serves so many different functions. Uh, but basically, it's the support of, uh, of, of the culture and, uh, and the uh, needs of our society, yes. Very good. Thank you so much. Now, it, now I'm clear. It's a, no, no right. argument. We don't need to debate on that topic anymore. And we are running out of time, but we normally end our program with two questions to our distinguished guests. So question one, if you were giving some advice to you uh, in 20s, in the early 20s, you know, the fresh out of college, what would you say? That uh, obviously you are a little bit older than me, and uh, I do have a lot of advice I want, I want to say to, to my early 20s myself. 
And the second question, I want to hear your advice to yourself, uh, if time travel permitted. Second question is, uh, is there any particular books or movie you'll enjoy in these days you want to recommend to our audience? Okay. Um, well, the first thing I would say is you're going to get older. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, you're going to get to a point in your life when you cannot work. I say this as a man who's going to be 85 in December. And, uh, and you're going to need money. And therefore, <laughs> if it's at all possible, uh, you should start saving. And you should start saving as, um, as young as is possible, steadily, even if it's just small sums of money, because the single most extraordinary thing in the world is compound interest. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you are, are diligent about it, uh, even small amounts of, of money uh, will uh, compound over time and be extraordinarily uh, uh, helpful in your, later, in your later years. And since most of us don't want to be dependent on our children uh, or on society to the extent that we can, mm -hmm. uh, we want to feel that we've uh, made our own way in the world, um, I think that that is something uh, that uh, you want to have a young person understand. The, mm -hmm. it's, compound interest is actually a magical uh, idea and, uh, and uh, can, transform, can transform your life. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, uh, now, um, I read widely. I read three newspapers a day. I read the local the Minneapolis newspaper. I read the Wall Street Journal. I read the New York Times. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I read everything from the Bible to, um, to essentially trashy, trashy contemporary mystery novel. Uh, when I was, when I was younger, I used to like to go into the bookstore and, and pick up a Robert Parker, for example, and I could read it standing in the bookstore. Yeah. I would, I would go through the book and until the, uh, the, the bookstore man would say to me, uh, Hey, fella, he said, he would say, this isn't a library. He said, either buy it or, or put it back. So um, uh, I, think, I think just general reading. Um, mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, I find reading the New York Times book review every, every Sunday is, oh, yes. uh, is, a very satisfactory, is a very satisfactory experience. Uh, and, um, and it keeps in your mind, even as you get older and you start forgetting things, uh, the names of authors that you've enjoyed in the past and books that you've read, because they are inevitably being referenced in one way or another in the book mm -hmm. reviews that are being written about contemporary books. Uh, and sometimes I find I go back and reread books that I haven't read in, in many years. Um, a book that you can read every year and never, and never completely master it mm -hmm. is Moby Dick. Oh, uh, yes, and, I agree. Yes. <laughs> it's a tough one. Yes. It's tough and it's long. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are there are mysteries to be found in it uh, constantly. Thank you so much, to President uh, Treptmer, uh, for your wise advice and uh, for your uh, terrific recommendation. And and most important, thank you so much for your time. It's really our distinguished honor and pleasure to have you on our show. I look forward to continuing continue our discussion because there are so many questions I want to ask you about, about higher education, about the leadership, and about the reading. So thank you again. Have a wonderful thank afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. See you Bye. next time. Take care. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.